Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jen Taylor Campbell. I'm a birth and bereavement doula, as well as an adoption and surrogacy doula. Doula means woman who serves. And although I love happy births, adoptions, and surrogacy, the pro bono part of my business is in bereavement. I'm here to help you. I'm also mom of 18, yes, 18 children, with over 30 years experience in the trenches as a mom myself. We have a huge blended family, and I've also experienced the loss of our adult son. Remember, give a shout out to those brave enough to share their stories on how they have become parents. Let's dive in. Welcome to Becoming Parents. I'm Jen Taylor Campbell, the host. And today I'm here with Lisa Skinner. Lisa, how are you? I'm doing well, Jen. How are you? I'm so I'm so awesome. I get really excited about my podcast guests. You are definitely no exception. We're going to jump in with your website first, because that's the premise of this. And I have your website and your Facebook group in the show notes. Um, it's called Truth Lies Alzheimer's. Um, so that's what we're talking about. And you made a comment when we were saying hello in the beginning that you may be a parent to children, but then you become a parent to your adults. And I loved that statement we can jump in with this wherever you want. Your website's amazing. I mean, you you have you're an author uh, an author more than one time. You have a podcast, speaking books, a uh, YouTube channel, blog, a lot, a lot webinars. So I don't know where you want to jump into this, but there's got to be a progression of this website coming to life. So jump right in. Okay. Well, just a little bit about my background. I am a behavior specialist. That's kind of what the, the term is, is called for what we do. There really aren't that many of us out there. But um, so we really kind of approach living with Alzheimer's disease and dementia from a psychosocial perspective versus a medical perspective. And what that means is uh, dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges that arise when you are caring for somebody or you have a loved one living with Alzheimer's disease slash dementia. And just to clarify those two terms, because <clears throat> a lot of people think they're two separate diseases, dementia really is, is a, an umbrella term that is broad-based and used to refer to the signs, symptoms, and behaviors that are associated with one of the brain diseases that causes dementia. So let me, let me um, kind of lay that out a little bit. There are over a hundred brain diseases that cause dementia. Alzheimer's wow. is the number one cause and the most common form of brain disease that causes dementia and the one that most of us um, are familiar with. But there are over 100 of them, which um, is kind of mind boggling. But when we use the term dementia, we're really referring to all of the signs and symptoms and, and behaviors that are caused by the changing brain um, that is happening due to the damage being done to the various parts of the brain by one of these brain diseases. So um, kind of to put it in perspective for everybody, if you are coming down with some kind of a, a virus and you're experiencing a variety of different symptoms and you go to your doctor and you say, yeah, I've got a fever and I've got chills and my body aches and I've got um, congestion. Well, you just described your symptoms to your doctor, right? And then it's up to the doctor to determine, okay, is this a cold? Is this the flu? Is this COVID? What's going on with you? When you, so, so think of that scenario um, in relation to dementia. So you just described your symptoms to your doctor. If you had Alzheimer's disease or one of the other brain diseases and you refer to the term dementia, those are the signs and the symptoms. But there are, again, just like there's over 100 brain diseases, there are so many symptoms 
And there's so many signs that we just refer to all of those generally as dementia. So dementia is not a specific illness. It is a syndrome. It is the symptoms that are caused by Alzheimer's disease. Now, the other thing that's pretty remarkable, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, a person can be suffering from more than one brain disease at the same time. So it's not uncommon for somebody to have Lewy body disease, vascular dementia, and Alzheimer's disease all happening at the same time. And those brain diseases are attacking and damaging different parts of the brain. And that's actually more common than people realize to have, and it's called mixed dementia. Um, Typically, it's two different brain diseases, but I've heard of people with multiple brain diseases that are going on simultaneously. Uh, So I have been counseling families for close to 30 years on what is happening to their loved one, their changing brain, what the disease is doing to their loved one, and what to expect. And then also very important, um, living with dementia is a very unique and complicated disease, living with brain disease. And there are a lot of symptoms that crop up on a daily basis that um, are very unusual and complicated. And so I, Uh, educate people on what those symptoms are, what to look for, the behaviors they can expect to see, and then how to respond and react to those behaviors. It's like learning a a completely new way of communicating. Like, let's say you lost your hearing, and you're going to still want to communicate with people, with your loved ones, with your family, but you can't hear a word they're saying. Um, so your family will have to adapt to, to your um, disability now, and they will do so by uh, learning sign language or writing things down on a piece of paper or lip reading, but it's, it's a different way of communicating, a new way of communicating, but the point is it's adapting to your new needs, and that's what we do with people living with brain disease. They actually get to a point where they cannot communicate with us anymore. Okay. They can't articulate their their wants and their needs. So it manifests in in alternative ways. And those ways typically show up as behaviors. Uh, There are such, uh, there's such a gamut of them. People become, agitated, they Mm -hmm. become angry, some um, can act out. Uh, People living with brain disease have hallucinations, they have delusions, they experience paranoia. So um, it's really important to recognize all of these things because they're all part of the disease. And then most importantly, the most effective way to react and respond to them so you don't um, escalate the situation into a more serious one. And that's what I do. Yay. Um, It's so interesting. I'm thinking about my great grandmother before she passed away and my grandmother's 94 now. And in my, like my opinion, and I'm not close by her, um geographically but in my opinion she's doing really really well right and I remember my great-grandmother I said to her you know how was in the in the independent living home they would have field trips I for lack of a better terminology and I would say how was your field trip today and she'd go oh Jennifer I don't remember what I ate for lunch today, but I remember what happened 50 years ago. And I actually put together a book about her life growing up during that time, because like, I don't really care how the field trip was or the, what she ate for lunch necessarily. I care that she felt happy discussing the things that were in her mind. And it was, for me, it was a great experience with my great grandmother. And we do Zoom meetings every other week with my grandmother now, and we ask her questions about her past 
And uh, you're explaining some of this and I'm seeing, of course, we know she's starting to forget. We know dementia is happening and I don't know which viruses she has, but it's really, it's, I, I mean, it's fascinating and it's sad. It's sad to watch it happen. You feel a little helpless as the person on the other end. You know, what can we do? How can we approach this? What conversations can we have? I remember my great grandmother being told she couldn't drive. Mm-hmm. That was like, that was like not a good conversation. Like I, I remember some of the things that were tougher and how we kind of focused on the things like, let, let, let's focus on what you do remember what is in what is, what thoughts are coming to your mind um and now i'm watching my grandmother respond in a very different way um with some similarities so it's fascinating but not in a happy way fascinating so i love that you do this because it's a really really challenging thing and we almost all of us are go, going to go through it with an yeah. older person and we're going to be that person too Yeah. And statistically, it's not looking very promising for over the next 10, 20, 30 years, the um, projections for the number of people that uh, will develop just Alzheimer's disease is going to nearly triple by the year 2050. And a lot of the responsibility is going to be put on the adult children and especially post-COVID we're seeing a huge shift in the way that families are caring for their loved ones. So what they, and they're bringing them home versus having them go to more institutional settings because Mm. of the impact that COVID had on people during the pandemic. We saw probably the highest instances of death in the elderly population especially those with Alzheimer's and dementia. And the uh, biggest impact on those folks was isolation and loneliness because nobody could go in and visit them. So a lot of families now are trying to be the caregivers and your role really reverses at that point. Yep. And the, the, as, the, as your loved one is progressing through the stages of the brain disease and becomes more and more helpless and more dependent on the caregiver, in a lot of cases, it's adult children, and uh, more specifically, the role usually lands in the lap of the daughters, mm-hmm. and you become the, the parent, so it's, it's a complete... Um, paradigm shift and it's a very awkward and difficult one that you know you were raised by this person and now all of a sudden you're in charge of everything you have to make all their decisions you have to recognize um, their needs and their wants and figure out what it is they're trying to tell you so you have really reversed your role from what it was when you were growing up and it's, it's a very uncomfortable place to be. So I work with families to try to make that situation less daunting and less stressful. But um, we're, seeing, we're seeing that trend now. And um, a lot of cultures, actually, they just believe in taking care of their own. They don't put their family members into institutional settings. But one of the things that I work with families to ensure is they can provide a very similar structured enriching environment um, in a home setting as easily as uh, they could find in an institutional setting. And this is really key to the vitality of a person living with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. I'm not surprised that things went more to home base at all because of COVID. And I know my grandmother got really sick during that time. And that's two years. It's been over two years now. We've been doing Zoom meetings with her because we're kind of spread out over the country. And that's helped keep us connected. And it was difficult because I could have flown. You know, I was looking at tickets to fly to see her, but I couldn't have actually really seen her. I couldn't have been in the room spending time with her holding her hand. So 
you feel that was a very helpless feeling situation where you wanted to immediately go there and be there. We weren't sure that she was going to live through that situation. And yet, even if we had all flown in, we would have been standing outside her window. Literally, that was, those were the rules. So that can be really hard. And that's kind of launched our continuation of these Zoom meetings so that we can all stay connected. And I love them. I I love being on, I record them. Why is the instance of dementia getting so much more in the near future? Because baby boomers, I would think it would be slowing down or am I, what am I off on? <clears throat> well, actually, you are spot on when you mention baby boomers, but the reason why the numbers are projected to almost triple by the year 2050 is due to the size of the generation okay. of the baby boomers. We are the largest uh, population ever to exist in history. Mm-hmm. And then you have to also factor in all of the risk factors that go into a person's chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. And there's a huge list of them. The number one risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease is age. Right. And statistically, by the time we reach the age of 85, one in three of us will have it. And we're living longer. So mm-hmm. all of these um, factors play a role in why the numbers are so staggering. And I can be um, quite candid with you about this. We're not prepared no. for the number of people that will be developing Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of the the responsibility is going to uh, lie with the adult children to care for their their um, aging parents and loved ones. I'm I'm glad I asked that, and I was pretty sure I was correct. I'm I'm really glad you clarified. Yeah, the generation's huge. I mean, it's massive. It's interesting you know, all I, all I have is my own experience with my great grandmother. She was, it was hard to take away her license and to encourage her. She was in an independent living. Again, we're all spread out. And my grandmother, having lived through that as an only child, she lived through that experience with her mother. And so she hit the point and I don't think she was that old. She was really vibrant, but earlier than a lot of people, she said, I don't want to take care of my entire house and my yard. I don't know my neighbors. I feel isolated in my own home. This was way, this was, you know, a decade plus ago. And so she decided to sell everything and live in an independent living situation because one, she didn't want that burden to fall on her siblings uh, I mean, her her children to make those decisions. She did it before she had any sort of signs of dementia. She was still driving. She was the youngest person in independent living because of her experience with her mom is my understanding. She wanted to take that burden off of her children. And she has a blast. She had a blast there. She would drive the older folks to their appointments. She gave up her license and that was not a difficult transition because she did not want that burden, the burden that she had with her mother to go to her kids. But you're right. I can see that my, you know, my uncles aren't taking up the, the caretaking. It's, it's my aunts that are taking up the caretaking. So I definitely see that. And I'm kind of watching the transition because I'm the oldest grandchild. So I'm watching this transition kind of curious about how it's going to go. And it's gone really well from my perspective, but it was interesting that my grandmother made very different decisions to remove the burden from her children. She didn't want any of us to have to go through that. Yeah, I I see a lot of that hmm. with, with folks and... Unfortunately, when it comes to brain disease, um, and it's a long course of um, between the time the symptoms emerge and um, 
the end. My grandmother, for example, lived with it for 20 years. The average is eight to 15 years. So that's a very, very long time when you think about it, that you um, may be caring for somebody that eventually will be 100% dependent on you to do everything for them because your, your brain is so damaged that you can't, um, you know, put, put uh, the sequence of tasks together anymore. And you need help with all your activities of daily living and you have uh, trouble, um, you've lost your ability to reason things out and, and to be logical about things. And you end up being um, dependent on your emotional response to things because, and these are all things that families have to work out for each individual going through the disease to provide uh, a stimulating and active and enriched life. And it's very difficult because a lot of the responses to the behaviors that we see and, and the personalities that surface from the changing brain are counterintuitive. So it's, it's definitely takes some very specialized um, training and knowledge. And that's the probably the key thing that I have learned in 30 years that I've been doing this is it all starts with people understanding the disease and what's happening to the brain of the person and what to expect as they progress through the steps and then learning this new way to communicate with them so it relieves stress from the relationship and the situa situations at hand versus escalating the stress into a much more serious situation. You said that we're really ill-equipped. And again, it's going to the, the number because of baby boomers, just the sheer number is going to be more difficult. What things can we do to prepare? What can families do to prepare? Because you're right, you're parenting your parent. And I know you said with dementia, there are there, like, I'm sure there are hundreds of symptoms. What are there like the top 10 most common that people can watch for? So those are two questions I have in dealing with this for people moving forward. H how do we How do we deal with it? What can we do? Learn all you can about the disease and what to expect, and then be prepared for the things that do show up. And some of the most common things like um, hallucinations and paranoia. One out of three people who live with Alzheimer's disease will develop hallucinations and paranoia. And there's also false beliefs and um, aggression sometimes if things escalate uh, to a certain point and talking about things that make absolutely no sense to the family member or the caregiver because of the damage done to the brain. Uh, and people, unfortunately, a lot of times don't relate a lot of the symptoms to the disease. They really associate Alzheimer's disease with a disease that causes short-term memory loss and confusion. And it is so much more complicated than that. There's just layers and layers and layers to understand. I've had so many family members over the years tell me, oh yeah, my mom has dementia, but she's also just gone crazy. And <laughs> And I have to remind people that this is not a mental illness. This is mm. brain disease. And your loved one has not gone crazy. What you're witnessing is caused by the disease. This is all part of the disease. So my best advice to anybody and everybody who finds themselves on this journey with a loved one or is caring for somebody that lives with this disease 
is to recognize this, the, uh, the symptoms that are associated with the disease and then understand the best practices to respond and effectively react to the different things that accompany the disease. And you can then, if you understand these things and know how to implement them into the relationship, then you can focus on what really matters in this whole thing is spending quality time with the person you're caring for or your loved one or both without it being a very stressful situation that is always combative and always filled with arguments and fighting and People who live with this disease can live very fulfilled, meaningful lives if the family members and the caregivers understand the best approach to all the things that surface as a result of this disease. And that's really what I have found is the key to unlocking the mysteries of this disease. And that's why I... My, my latest book is called Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's, Its Secret Faces, because I cover everything about the, the, the naked truth about this disease, the myths, mm-hmm. i.e. lies, um, misconceptions, misperceptions, and then its secret faces are all of these things that surface as a result of the damage being done to the brain. And as I mentioned before, they typically manifest in behaviors. But keep in mind, the behaviors you see coming out of this disease are that person's way of communicating their wants and their needs because they can no longer articulate them to us. But the onus is on us to figure out what the trigger of the behavior was and what it is they're trying to tell you. Are they cold? Are they hungry? Are they in pain? So we have to go through kind of a process of elimination to try to figure out what triggered the behavior and what it is they're trying to tell us. Is it a good thing in my mind when with my great grandmother and my grandmother, when they can't, when the short term memory is one of the first things that I noticed, I think with both of them, it probably wasn't the first thing that presented, but again, I'm not there all the time, every day. um, And they're not living with me. So is it good to focus on what they can remember and talk about the memories that they, there's a lot of frustration in trying to remember what's happening, what they ate for lunch, for example, you know, they know that they don't remember um, in the beginning and it's frustrating to both of them. And there's not aggression, but it is frustrating that they can't remember what happened today. Is it a good thing that it's like, you know, that's okay. Let's talk about what happened 50 years ago. Is that a good approach or should it's we be approach? It's the approach. Okay. It's okay. Joining their reality. And the analogy that I use to explain to people that I have found it enables them to really wrap their head around what has happened uh, when the short-term memory kind of malfunctions is this. And I think this will be really helpful to a lot of people. Think of the short-term memory as having a light switch hooked up to it, just like a lamp. Okay. And you can turn that lamp through the switch on, or you can turn it off. The first part of the brain with Alzheimer's disease is damage to the short-term memory. In the beginning of the disease, in the early stages, you're that switch that controls your short-term memory is on most of the time. And once in a while, that switch gets flipped off. Right. The long-term memory stays intact throughout the entire disease, for the most part. Some people, by the end stage of their disease, they have zero short-term memory. But um, for the most part, 
the long-term memory remains throughout the entire disease. In the middle stages of the disease, that switch that controls the short-term memory is on about half the time and is flipped okay. off about half the time. Now, when this happens and the short-term memory kind of short circuits or that switch is flipped off, that person then has to pull from their long-term memory because that's what they have that's functioning. Mm -hmm. And that is the exact reason why they can't remember what they just asked you two seconds ago, mm -hmm. but they can remember the songs from the words from songs that they heard 60, 70 years ago, because yeah. they're pulling from that long-term memory. So think of that person when that, when that short-term memory switch gets flipped off, they are now living their life in reverse and they're reverting back in their minds to a previous time in their life. And it's different for everybody. I've seen people regress to their childhoods and they're, they're talking to you like they think you're their parent because in their minds, that's who you are because right. they're pulling from their past long-term <laughs> memory. I've seen people revert to their adolescent years, to their uh, 20s, to their 30s. And the best way to figure out what, where they're pulling their memories from, and keep in mind, wherever they're pulling from becomes their reality for that time until that switch gets flipped back on. And then by the end of the disease, it's off more than it's on. So the way that you can tell what period of life they, they're pulling their memories from is to listen for the cues of what they're talking about. So let me give you an example. My mother-in-law also suffered from Alzheimer's disease. And when that switch was flipped off, she'd look at my husband, who was her son, and she would call him Otto. And Otto was her brother. Mm -hmm. She did not recognize my husband as being an, her adult son because she had regressed in her life back to her teenage years. Mm -hmm. She hadn't been married yet. She did not have any of her five children yet. She was, in her mind, she was 12, 13, 14 years old. And she knew she recognized my husband, but she couldn't possibly have a grown son. So she believed that he was Otto and she started talking about the tennis matches that the two of them had and how great they did. So that's what, that's when, when her short-term memory switch went off, she pulled from her adolescent years. And this is the reason why people with Alzheimer's disease at times can't recognize their loved ones because they probably don't exist in their reality yet. So to kind of piggyback on what you were saying, mm -hmm. the absolute best approach, the only approach that works is to do what we call join their reality because mm -hmm. there's no way you can pull them back into yours until that switch gets flipped back on. So you got to go with whatever it is that their wherever their minds are at that time because that is their reality and nothing anybody does or says is going to change that reality until that switch gets flipped back on. So does that make sense? Yes, it does. I'm I'm glad because the default for me, in my opinion, was to just let's just meet her where she's at with my great grandmother. Yes. And it was wonderful because I, I put together a book about her life growing up from those all of those conversations. And it was I got to know my great grandmother in a way I would have never gotten to know her had she not had the, the disease of dementia. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't have ever, I don't think we think to ask uh, the elderly people in our lives about what it was like for them. They're this wealth of knowledge. And it reminded me sometimes of a toddler where you were saying, you don't know what's wrong. So you're just ruling things out. 
right? And they're tantruming sometimes because they're irritated because you can't figure it out, but you're really trying to rule it out. And there's some frustration in that. And also it, it, it's easier to be a parent of a toddler than a parent of a parent, because that's not like my brain would have to switch gears and think about that person in a very different way. But I love meeting them where they're at as far as their short and long-term memory. But I love how you described it because it makes, I feel relieved that, yes, I mean, we, we ask about what's happening now. And if there's ever like an, I don't remember or <clears throat> a frustration about it, it's like no big deal. And, you know, my grandmother talks about like that boy she liked that kissed her. <laughs> and it's really, it can be a really fun uh, happy, engaging time where you get to learn about this person in such a different way. And that part of it, like in a situation that's difficult, I really love that part of it a so lot. One of the things that you can do to kind of dig deeper is let's say she's talking about the boy she met and he kissed her. Well, in her mind, this is a recent occurrence. And just ask open-ended questions like, oh, tell me more about that experience. How did it make you feel? And let her tell her story. And just keep digging and just say, oh, tell me more about that. I love that story. That is such a great story. I'd like to hear more about it. And just let them spill. Let them tell their story. And you will create so much joy for that person through that conversation. And they may not remember the conversation that you have with, uh, with them through FaceTime or whatever, but they'll remember the feeling that you helped create for them. That feeling, that emotional feeling will stay with them for a long time. And it'll be such a, a, a wonderful, warm, heart felt feeling that you helped create for that person through their memories. So just, just let them tell their story and just keep saying, well, tell me more about that. I love your story and dig deeper and let them, let them talk because it creates such feelings of joy for them. And that's what they need. That's really what they need. I want to end and wrap up on a comment that you made about how we're ill-prepared and people are moving to home. What can what can the caregiver, the child, do to make the situation? I mean, we've talked about meeting them where they're at and their memories, but how can we make it as much of an enriching experience? Because when you think high number and more at home and feeling like we're not as equipped to handle that, are there again, are there like the top several things that you can do as a home caregiver of your parent that make that easier? Yes. Okay. Um, what I see in a lot of home environment situations is the person basically sits around all day, watches TV. Uh, people who live with Alzheimer's disease and dementia really do better in a structured environment and they have they're on a routine because familiarity becomes extremely important to them okay so you want to put them kind of on a schedule and you know have breakfast every day at the same time go for a walk um, do some chair exercises so basically have like an activity program and it doesn't have to be anything really fancy but uh, the point being is structure and routine becomes extremely important to um, creating an enriched environment for somebody. And you want to do the, the activities, like if you're going to go for a walk, it's better to do it in the earlier part of the day than in the later part of the day. Okay. And you can um, just learn the, the different things that, um, you know, like talk about uh, the current events that's that's a great activity or I mean there's a lot of things that you can do that I don't probably don't really have time but the answer yeah. to the question is yes 
it does make a huge difference to the quality of life that you could pr be providing for your loved one in a home setting um, that emulates the type of setting that you'll typically find in a memory care facility um, that we basically know um, does help enrich their lives and give them a much more meaningful life. Awesome. I have your website, which has your book. Have you written two books? And I'm, yes. And um, the first one is called Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. And then the second one is The Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's, It's Secret Faces. Mm -hmm. And we just came out with an audio book. It just came mm -hmm. out like two weeks ago. And it, it's um, kind of a fun audio book mm -hmm. to listen to if people prefer that. And I also offer a training course to teach okay. people all the things that we talked about today. So awesome. they can be prepared. So more information about that is... Um, on the website, but I think really the um, what I what I've seen just really shift in the last couple of years since COVID is finally people are kind of pulling their heads out of the sand and being more willing to talk about this topic because it is impacting so many families and will continue. So. Let, don't be afraid to have the conversation. It's no longer just family business. And um, learn all you can about the disease if you find yourself in this situation, because your life will be so much easier if you really start there and understand the, the basic fundamentals of what's happening to your loved one. Lisa, thank you so much for being on and for sharing this. This was fascinating and it's information I think it really needs to get out there more. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here very, very much.